parents get asked some tough questions sometimes. Uh, and of course, you're never in a place or position or appropriate time where you can respond and answer like with the depth and compassion and wisdom that you actually need to in the moment. It's always like in the checkout line at the grocery store or when like you're trying to strap one kid in the car seat and the other one's just sitting there eating Cheetos and just looking at you or like what happened to me the other night. So both my girls were pretty sick this last week. Fortunately, negative on all counts, flu, strep, COVID, all negative, which very happy about that. Uh, but the other night, as uh, my oldest daughter, Lily, as I was putting in her bed, um, I was like, hey, you know, can I pray for you? And she had this pause. She was like, oh, yeah, I guess. Sure. I was like, what do you mean? Yeah, you guess. Sure. Like, what do you what's is something going on? She's like, well, it's just that the other night I prayed and I asked God to take away my cough and he didn't take away my cough. And I just don't understand why. If he is good and he loves me and he can do anything then why wouldn't he take my cough away? I didn't want my cough and it's not good for me. So why didn't he take it away? How come he didn't make me better? And of course, you know, right? It's like, it's like a little bit past her bedtime. She's sick. She's got school now tomorrow. Like she's ready to go and all this, you know, what do you do, right? How do you answer that? And, uh, you know, a lot of times as parents, we want to be able to go back and say, man, I wish I could have answered that one better. I think I did an okay job with this one, tried to handle it in the moment, respond appropriately to her, her very serious and actual real concerns, you know, which is how come when I pray sometimes, uh, God doesn't answer in the way that I think he should or that I want him to. How come sometimes it seems like God doesn't hear my prayers, which is a valid question and something worth considering uh fortunately i was able to work my way back through some circuitous logic and gave her something like this I was like well hey but hadn't you been taking medicine she's like yeah it's like well where'd the medicine come from well i guess like fruits and stuff it's like well where do the fruits and stuff come from trees where do the trees come from uh i guess god made them yeah god made them and who put the fruits and stuff together to make the medicines uh, people? It's like, yeah, and who made people? Well, God. So, ipso facto, does that not mean that God is the one who has made you better? <laughs> right? I mean, the logic here. I mean, hang with me. She just kind of thought about it. And she's like, huh, yeah, I guess so. And I just mic drop and I walk out the room, you know, and, and then I went back in and put her to bed. Um, you get the idea, right? Is that um, these are real questions. And sometimes as parents, it's hard to make sense of them. Uh, but as hard as that is for parents, in particular instances with our kids, it's also hard for all of us as human beings, because all of us have questions, and all of us have doubts sometimes, and all of us have been asked questions that maybe we wished we had a better answer to. And so what we're doing in this series is just taking your questions, uh, and I'm looking forward to it. We've gotten some great ones so far, and uh, we're going to jump right on in today. But before we do that, what I would like to say is if you do have any questions at all, I'd love for you to submit them. So you can either drop them in the comments below in this video. You can send them to our email address, which is uh, which is in the, the info in this post as well. Uh, just let us know what your questions are. Um, today, what we're going to be fielding are questions that broadly fall in the category of religion. So what I try to do is to take the various questions that folks asked and had a lot of great questions and to separate them into general categories. And so I'm going to try to address them in the categories. I think it will make more sense uh, rather than me repeating things over the course of a lot of different videos just to help to to stay thematically on on topic so hopefully that helps gonna jump right in to the first question uh today which uh again i said these are questions about religion and so here's a here's a question someone sent in in a world with so many different religions how can we know that christianity is the right one because don't they all claim to be the right one and honestly, that's a pretty good question, right? <laughs> because inherently they do. They all claim to be the right one. If they're all claiming to be the right one, that means inherently that some of them are the wrong ones. Maybe they're all the wrong ones. I don't know. How can we know then that Christianity is the, quote, right one? Uh, well, there's a lot that I could say about it. Um, and I guess what, what I'd want to say at the start is, you know, maybe we need to start with a definition of what religion actually is, right? Because I think... Um, in our world, as the term is commonly used to talk about religion, it maybe means some different things than it's meant throughout human history. Uh, so, I mean, if you just go to a dictionary, I, I, full disclosure, I do not like when I hear someone quote the dictionary to me in like a talk or a sermon or a lecture or whatever. I don't usually like it. 
Um, sometimes I think it might be helpful. So in this instance, because of the point I'm trying to make, I'm actually gonna tell you what the dictionary definition of religion is. So forgive me, like I don't personally like that very often. So just, you know, if that's not your thing, just hang with me, all right? Anyway, um, this is Oxford English Dictionary defines religion in this way. The belief in and worship of a superhuman controlling power, especially a personal God or gods, a particular system of faith and worship. Uh, to which I would say, I mean, that is how I think it's commonly used in the world today. Um, but that is not necessarily what it actually is. I mean, when we're thinking about and talking about the idea of religion, I think we are talking about something that's more and more broadly encompassing than that. And I also think religion in general is more broadly encompassing than that. At a basic level, I would maybe tweak that definition. I mean, I think there's elements of it that are good. Um, this idea of a superhuman controlling power, I don't I maybe scratch that one out. Because at a basic level, religion is, it's a series of um, various practices, rituals, beliefs, doctrines that help to help us to make sense of our world. And to make sense of, of uh, the place that we are and what's going on in the world around us. I'd say that's more so what religion is rather than just this kind of defining it simply by intellectual ideas or beliefs. Um, the word itself, which I think is interesting and, and is important for us to consider, the word itself comes from Old English. Um, it was used to refer to someone who was living under a monastic vow. So in this context, I mean specifically for us, the English word religion uh, comes within a Christian context, someone living as a monk in, in England, apparently, in ancient England. Um, that's not a thing, but you know, Old English. Uh, I'm gonna stop talking about that now and transition to Latin. So, cause where this word actually comes from is from uh, possibly from two different kinds of Latin words. The first one is religio, which, which has a connotation of obligation or reverence, which then makes sense with the connecting it to the Old English monastic vow. The other one that's commonly uh, referenced in terms of, of the etymology of religion is this idea of the, the word religare which um, means to bind together. Uh, and so it's this idea that there are these practices that bind us together as people around a cohesive set of like structures, institution, belief, etc. cetera. Um, I think that that's important for us to, to note and to pay attention to, but then to, to pay attention to something else, which is that our modern idea of religion um, is this kind of thing this sort of set of stuff that's over here that's separate maybe from the rest of life. That's an idea that doesn't really come into human thought until the 18th and 19th century during this period that's called the Enlightenment. Prior to that, the idea that there's this separate category of religion over here, it just that's not simply how people thought. What we would term religion was just simply part of life. It was part of everyday life. And it's only in very recent human history that we separate um, the idea of the sacred and the secular. And we put them in two different spheres or categories. It's not the way that most of human history has thought about it. And I think it's important for us to consider because the religions that we're talking about are generally pretty old. I mean, at least in the order of thousands of years old. Uh, particularly important for us who maybe follow Jesus or who are Christians, which I'm assuming that a number of people who are watching this video at least have some familiarity with that tradition. Otherwise, I doubt you'd be here. Um, and so I think it's it's helpful for us then to consider um, a few things. Number one is that in the New Testament, in the time of Jesus, they're not thinking in terms of religious categories, simply talking about life. Um, but that kind of leads us to the second part of this, which is, and well, the first part of the question really is that there's many different religions in the world. And so maybe you ask the question is why, why are there so many religions? Or maybe why is there religion at all? Well, I think at a basic level, what that tells us is that if there's a phenomena that's across human history and across time and space, that maybe there's something to it. That human beings are like these, these meaning making machines. We want to understand our world. We want to make sense of the world around us. Um, and we have been this way for millennia. And and at a very basic level, what I think religion is, is it's, it's our human attempt to mediate with the divine. It's our human efforts to reach out to that which is eternal in some sense, and perhaps timeless uh, in other ways. Now, I think that's, that's important for us to know, because 
religion then is not just simply the things that we think of, whether that's Islam or, or, or Judaism or Christianity, kind of the three traditional monotheistic religions, whether that's Buddhism, Hinduism, Zoroastrianism, baseball, I mean, you name it, right? It's these series of practices that, that we look to to connect us with this timelessness of eternity, something that's, something that's ultimate and, and, and deserving of worship. Because that is maybe the second piece of it, right? Which is that it, it, we kind of observe the many different religions and think, well, human beings at a basic level then are worshipful creatures. We are beings that worship, that place ultimate worth and value on something and orient our lives towards it. Which is maybe a good way of thinking about religion as well. Like what the things that we're placing ultimate value on and orienting our lives towards. That's that's essentially what worship is. Um, Tom Oden uh, um theologian, a professor who I will quote later on, put it like this. He said that, that religion is a universal human phenomenon, which I think it is, and I think that's helpful for us. Um, you know, Dietrich Bonhoeffer was a guy in the 1920s, 30s. He's a German theologian. He was ultimately killed by the Nazis in 1945. But he picked up on this idea that was put forward by Karl Barth, who was a German Protestant theologian, also around this time, and, and it's this idea of what they called a religionless Christianity, which is that Christianity, as it's often thought of today, is thought of as a religion, right? That it's, again, just like everything else, and we can lump it into the same category. But, but Bonhoeffer's point was that um, Christianity, maybe as it was practiced before it was Christianity, was something uniquely different. Uh, this is what he said, and I think it's helpful for us. He said this, Jesus claims for himself in the kingdom of God, the whole of human life in all of its manifestations. In other words, their point is that religion is a man-made construct. I mean, as we think of it today, religion is a man-made construct. And so we shouldn't look to the religion itself, but look through it or beyond it to what it's actually pointing to. It's this idea the Apostle Paul talks about in 1 Corinthians 13 that right now we see only through a glass dimly, but one day we shall see all and, and know all fully, but right now it's a little bit dim. Their point is, is that essentially all religions are not the right one, that there isn't a right religion. Now that's not to say that um, Christianity is not true or that anything in any other religion is not true. Their point is that it's just simply not about a religion because it is not Christianity that saves people. It's not Christianity that's remaking the world. It's not Christianity that is um, making all things new. It's God and the kingdom of God and his son Jesus. And it is what the, the religion is pointing to that we need to focus our time, effort, and attention on rather than the religion itself. I hope that makes sense. It's a little bit of a dense idea. These guys were like some real eggheads, I'll tell you that. Um, but that takes us to Jesus, I think, which is an important uh, element of this when we're talking about Christianity and how we can think of Christianity as the right one. Because I kind of want to make the point, it's not about uh, being a Christian, but it is all about Jesus. And, and I think that's an important distinction that does need to be made. Jesus explained it like this, um, I, and we have to remember that he is the Jewish Messiah. I mean, he's growing... He, he is in a particular context, uh, a, what we would call a religious context, and he's coming out of that. But he is, a, I mean, as the Jewish Messiah, he is from this people with whom God has made a covenant to bless all the nations on the earth. He comes as the representative anointed king of that nation uh, to declare God's kingdom, his authority, his rule over the entire world. Um, and, and Jesus frames that um, in particular, not by calling people to become Christians, but that anyone who, quote, would be saved, anyone who would enter into that kingdom uh, needs to come through him, that he is the gate to the kingdom. He said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. He said, anyone who wants to, to come after me must deny themselves, take up their cross, and follow me. Anyone who wants to be my disciple must do that. Uh, he said, you are too, talking to his disciples, go into all the world and make disciples of all nations. So we see it, it's not about being a Christian, but it, is, but it is about our identity in relationship to Jesus. And I think that's helpful for us because when Jesus talks about this idea of eternal life, he says the eternal life is this, is knowing the Father and knowing the Son whom he sent into the world. It is about a, a relational knowing 
far more than it is checking all of the religious boxes, um, which I think is probably helpful for us, hopefully is helpful for you. Um, Tom Oden, who I referenced earlier, he said this, I think it was helpful for us. He said, Christianity differs from the religions of the world in that its understanding of God comes not from human striving intellect and will, but from God's own self-disclosure in human history through the people of Israel, which culminates and clarifies itself finally and only in Jesus Christ. It just re-emphasized the fact that this is all pointing towards Jesus and is not about the religion itself. Because within the realm of Christianity, which is a pretty broad net, there's a lot of different practices and rituals and emphases, which are not wrong, right? It's just they're not the end. They're not the end. They're the means to the end, but they're not the end. And our real challenge is that as human beings, we tend to make the religion the end itself. Um, even worse than in Christianity, where the means that we have are pointing to an incredibly true end. And so one of these premises that we're going to come back to throughout this entire probably series, but certainly today, is the idea that Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. That if something is true, it belongs to him. If something is good, true, or beautiful, these great transcendentals that Thomas Aquinas talked about, if something is good, true, or beautiful, it belongs to Jesus. Now, taking that, I just want to end this question with this, uh, this quote from C.S. Lewis, which I think is helpful. Uh, he wrote this in Mere Christianity. He said, if you are a Christian, you do not have to believe that all the other religions of the world are simply wrong all the way through. If you're an atheist, though, you do have to believe that the main point in all the religions of the whole world is simply one huge mistake. If you're a Christian, you're free to think that all these religions, even the strangest ones, contain at least some hint of truth. When I was an atheist, I had to try to persuade myself that most of the human race has always been wrong about the question that mattered to them most. When I became a Christian, I was able to take a much more liberal view. But of course, being a Christian does mean thinking that where Christianity differs from other religions, Christianity is right and they are wrong. I mean, it has to, naturally, uh, by exclusivity. He says, as in arithmetic, there is only one right answer to a sum, and all other answers are wrong. But some wrong answers are much nearer to being right than others. I think that's a helpful place for us to land that plane. So on to question number two, and it's this. Does one have to attend church in order to be a Christian? Which is a great question, and honestly one that I get uh, a fair amount. And um, I'd say at one level, I mean, this is a bit of a, a bit of a facetious answer, so hang with me. At one level, I would say yes. Yes, you must. If the goal is simply being a Christian, um, then it, in terms of the, re the very religious sense of that word, as far as like that's your end, then attending church would seem to be part of that. Yeah, uh, it'd be like someone who was a member of a club but then never actually went to the club, you know? It would seem to go with it. But of course, part of what I was just talking about in the previous question is that the goal is not to become a Christian. The goal is to be a disciple of Jesus. And part of the challenge for us is that we live, particularly in the United States, particularly where I am in East Tennessee, maybe where you are too, you can be a Christian and not be a disciple. But Dallas Willard makes this point, the New Testament knows no category of Christian that is not a disciple. It's not an actual disciple of Jesus. You can be, in other words, in this country, a, quote, nominal Christian, where you sort of maybe kind of believe, but you don't actually do anything with it and it doesn't affect your life in any way whatsoever. That is not simply how the earliest Christians, the earliest followers of Jesus, lived and believed. It's just, it, that's not how they lived their life. Um, and I think that's good for us to remember. And so what I would then go is to take a step beyond, I guess, because um, when we look at that question, a lot of times when I get questions like this, it's because someone has an agenda, right? I mean, we all have reasons for our questions, but usually it's something like this, is on the one hand, someone wants me to say, uh, no, you don't have to because they don't want to go to church. Or on the other hand, someone wants me to say, yes, you do have to because they have someone that they're trying to convince to go to church with them that won't go to church, but they said, I'm a Christian, but you don't need to go to church. It's about a relationship, not religion. And all that stuff that we've all heard so many times in so many different ways. Um, so I think we just have to note that up front and then maybe take that next step and say, well, it's not, it can't be about church attendance at one level because, you know, what about someone who's homebound and can't attend church? What about someone, I don't know, COVID, what happened last year? What happened then? Were we all then, quote, not Christians or you get a special dispensation? Does it, how's that work? 
Um, well, that's why I go back to, to what I mentioned before, um, that it, it presupposes this question does a couple things. And so I just want to define some terms. So we talked about what it means to be a Christian, uh, about being a disciple of Jesus. And maybe I then want to move that next step and say, okay, then what is the church, right? What is the church? Um, the church is essentially what we call the community of believers. Literally, the word that we translate in the New Testament, ecclesia, that translates to church, um, how it's often translated in our Bibles, church. Uh, that word ecclesia literally means the called out ones, the called out ones, the ones Jesus called out, right? The called out ones. Um, it's used oftentimes in the New Testament to talk about that community of believers, but what I would maybe take us a step further and say is that that's not the word that's most commonly used for believers uh, in the New Testament. The word that's most commonly used to define believers in the New Testament is brothers, which is interesting. Uh, defining people not in terms of maybe how we would think of it in terms of a religious institution, but defining people in terms of relationship, right? Relationship with one another, brothers and sisters. Um, if you are a believer, uh, then I think what we can say is that whether you belong to a church, as we think of them, whether you go to church on Sunday or don't go to church on Sunday, if you are a believer in any capacity, a follower of Jesus, then you are part of the church. You are part of his family because he has called you out into a new life. And that makes you brothers and sisters with other people who are also part of that family. Uh, the Apostle Paul makes the point in one of his letters to the Corinthians that the church is, is the body of Christ. And if you are part of his family, part of his church, because you believe, simply that, it has nothing to do with what you've decided in terms of putting a membership anywhere, filling out forms or rituals or applications. If you believe and you've received the Spirit, then what that means is that you are part of that family. You are part of that body, whether you like it or not. Now, I know that can be a little challenging and, and maybe a little confusing, but I guess what I'd say then is if you're a believer and you're part of the family, then maybe ask that next question, which is that if I'm part of the family, what then is required of me? Uh, and I think what we need to see is that, you know, at one level, this isn't about just attending a, a worship service in order to be a good Christian. It's about being a part of the family uh, of also of followers of Jesus to be formed in the image of love. Right? Because if the goal is not to become a, for human life, is not to be a Christian, the goal then is to become uh, who God would make us to be, who he would have us to be. The goal is to become love, to live in union and intimacy with him, to live as a mediator of his divine presence into the world. Right? That's, who, that's who we're called to be. Uh, that's what the church is called to be, and it, and it does that as a family. I mean, Christianity in that sense is not an individual sport. It's a team sport. Because if God is love, and if he's calling us to be a people of love, where love is the great commanding ethic, then, then by necessity and definition, there have to be other people involved. You cannot do it on your own. You can't. I don't know if I'm just saying, like, you're not strong enough or smart enough or wise enough, which I hate to say it, but you're probably not. Uh, it's not just that. It's that you literally can't do it. it, it, it does, love requires multiple parties involved here. And just one other note on it, right? Which is that like sometimes we think, well, if I don't like someone in my church or there's problems in my church or there's problems in the church out there and, and so I can't, I can't be a Christian or go to church until, until I find the perfect church. Well, the, here's the news for you. You're never going to find a perfect church. And part of the reason you're never going to find a perfect church is because you're not going to find perfect people. Uh, and what we're called to, to be, who we're called to be, is to be increasingly formed in the image of love. And when Jesus talks about love, he says there's a few different kinds of people that we are to love. First of all, we're to love the people that are around us every single day of our lives. What he would call our neighbors, the people that we interact with. Um, we are called to love ourselves. We are called to love God with all that we've got. Uh, but we are also called to love our enemies. Because it's when you learn to love and, you're, and you practice that, loving people who actively don't like you and who are doing harm to you, and to, for you then to will their good, it changes something in you. And that's really important for the character formational piece of what it means to become a follower of Jesus. We're, we're going to talk more on discipleship and some other questions about that in a future uh, installment. I have some great questions around that, which we're going to get to. But hopefully that helps on the, the church attendance piece. So on to question number three.
This is a pretty good one too. I, I like this one. What will happen to those who lived and died before Christianity arrived? And then a similar and related question that I put with it. What about those who have never heard the gospel through no fault of their own, where they just grew up in a country where it just wasn't there or no one ever explained it to them or taught it to them? What about, what about them? What happens to people essentially who have never heard of Jesus and never heard the gospel? Uh, and I think that touches something within us because at one level, right, we've all heard the, the like religious answers like, well, they've had an opportunity on the one hand or, well, God's predestined some and he's predestined others to just never hear. He's predestined them to hell. That's another answer that sometimes we hear. Um, but it, it seems to strike us at one level as really unfair. So what, what do you mean? They never had a chance. These folks never had a shot. You know, what are we supposed to, supposed to do about that? Um, I think the way that I answer it, maybe even the simplest way is what happens to these folks is, is, well, only God knows. And I don't mean that to like punt away and to try to, to say, no, 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 I'm not, not going to take it. No, but it, it very only God knows. He's the only one who can know. But I will say is this, is that God is good and he is love and he is fair and he is just and he will deal with everyone in a manner that is better than they deserve. And I think that's sometimes hard for us to reckon with. Um, but I, I think that's fundamentally true and needs to be the framework with which we address this question. But I will talk about some other things that are related to it, which is this idea that the Apostle Paul points out in Romans 1, which is often used to talk about um, folks who have never heard the gospel as not having an excuse, which is, seems to be what Paul says here. So Romans 1, verses 20 to 23. He said, For since the creation of the world, God's invisible qualities, his eternal power and divine nature have been clearly seen, being understood from what has been made, so that people are without excuse. For although they knew God, they neither glorified him as God nor gave thanks to him, but their thinking became futile, and their foolish hearts were darkened. Although they claimed to be wise, they became fools and exchanged the glory of the immortal God for images made to look like a mortal human being, and birds, and animals, and reptiles. Um, I think the important thing for us to pay attention to there from what Paul is saying um, is that like what we talked about in the first question, that there is something within human experience that points to God, uh, that we have just some kind of vague sense of this, and that in varying degrees and times, people have gotten this more right and less right, uh, but that in most ways, we haven't gotten this perfectly right, but that there was this where God has directly revealed himself to people. I mean, through his covenants with the people of Israel, um, and then ultimately through his covenant with all the world through the person of Jesus, um, that these are the, the means and the methods through which we come to the clearest picture of who he is and what he's up to in the world, um, which is often passed down to us through what we call the Bible, through scripture, through the New Testament, the Old Testament, through the teaching and tradition of the church. Um, it, it's mediated to us through those things. Um, I just would like to remind us that that the goal again is not adherence to a proper uh, religion but adherence to a particular religion but is a proper orientation of our lives uh, to the one true God and so to the question right what happens to people um, who lived and died before Christianity arrived well the important part of that is that it, Christianity arriving is not that important to probably the heart behind this question, which is, you know, where are these people? Are they in heaven? Are they in hell? Are they with God? Are they away from God? I mean, what happened to them? Well, the arrival of Christianity is in some ways irrelevant then. Christianity did a lot for human civilization, but Christianity doesn't save anyone. It's Jesus who saves people. It's God who is the one who is active in the world. Christianity didn't do that. And so I just want to make that nuance clear. Um, the important point is not the arrival of Christianity, but the arrival of Christ. Uh, what he did, who he was, what that's all about, and about God doing something unique um, in human history. Um, I guess, you know, two things specifically to it. For those who lived before Jesus, I mean, we have this, this covenant with, that God makes with Israel. I, I mean, that's real, right? And so anyone who is living under that covenant would be with him. To me, that makes complete sense. Uh, it seems to be in harmony with the scriptures and, and what they're saying. Uh, but also this idea that it was the, the mission of the people of Israel to then be a blessing to all the world. 
uh, at a very fundamental level, I mean, this scripture will come up uh, again and again throughout um, from the Old Testament through the New Testament. Everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. I mean, this is in some ways traditional Jewish belief, right? Everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. It is, it's incredibly easy to be saved, as a matter of fact. And it's sometimes, ironically, Christians who should have the highest emphasis on grace and our lack of activity in saving oneself that we sometimes make this much harder than it needs to be. It's incredibly easy. And God will save whoever he wants to. And we just kind of put it there at, at, at one level. Um, I keep saying that at one level, but we're on, we have many levels that we're going on right now. Um, I'd say another thing that, that comes to mind is this word from the Apostle Peter. He writes in 1 Peter 3, uh, verse 19, in one of his letters, he wrote this. Uh, he's talking about Jesus that after being made alive, he went and made proclamation to the imprisoned spirits. This idea that's talked about in the Apostles' Creed, and, and so in our in-person services, we, we recite the Apostles' Creed together. But um, this idea that Jesus, when he died, he descended to the dead. Uh, and that in that place, he proclaimed the good news of the kingdom of God to all those who had died. Um, and so, you know, the New Testament, I think, is incredibly vague about... Um, when exactly uh, one has to, quote, make this decision, when one has to call on the name of the Lord, does it have to happen before they, they breathe their last breath on this earth? Can it happen after? Uh, I mean, the New Testament is generally pretty vague about this. And I think a lot of times when we, when we try to press for, a, for an absolute certain answer on it, sometimes we're doing a disservice to the text. And, and I think we also have to consider our motivations. And, and very often in my experience, sometimes the motivations are simply trying to get people to check a religious box and say that they're in um, and that they're on our side. You know, I think that's something to consider. Uh, for those who maybe have never heard of the name of Jesus before, I, I maybe go with this other direction too. It's a story that C.S. Lewis tells in his, his final book of the Narnia series, The Last Battle. It's a story of a soldier um, who fought for the the enemy army, the enemies of Narnia, uh, he served this, this kind of violent, pagan-ish god of Tash. Um, and uh, when this soldier dies and he stands before Aslan, um, Aslan welcomes, he's, he's afraid, he's terrified, but Aslan welcomes him in and he's confused. He's like, but I served your enemy my entire life and I've been told this, this, and this. He said, no, you don't understand. He said, you serve with love and with obedience and with faithfulness. He's like, that is not Tash. He's like, that, is, that belongs to me. In other words, back to this idea that we talked about with Jesus, right? That what is good and what is true and what is beautiful, it belongs to him. And so where faith and obedience and love is rendered, then it is done unto God. I think that's maybe another helpful way for us to think about it, think about it too. Uh, but I guess the last thing that I'll say is that I don't want any of this to in any way think that we can just kind of dispense with this idea of evangelism, of telling people who Jesus is and about what he's done. It seems pretty clear that Jesus wants us to do that. Now, why does he want us to do that? Because he is inaugurating his kingdom on earth as it is in heaven. Because the goal of evangelism is not simply to get souls into heaven when they die. It's that people would begin to live in the kingdom right now. And that when they die, the natural consequence will be they'll continue living in that kingdom. That's an important distinction to make, though. And uh, and one that I hope is helpful. So uh, on to question number four. This is a good question too. And it's where we'll land our, our plane for today is the last one. It's a question about Jordan Peterson, um, if you know him. And if you don't, uh, I'll give you a, a quick rundown on Jordan Peterson. So he is a um, clinical psychologist. Uh, I think he teaches at, the, at somewhere around Toronto. I know he did at some point. I think he might still, I'm not really sure. Uh, he's written a few books, very popular, done series on YouTube. Um, uh, he's a clinical psychologist who is not a professed Christian, doesn't seem to have, um, I mean, any professed religious beliefs necessarily, but he uses the Bible very often to, to explain psychological concepts and has had a lot of success with that. I mean, millions and millions of people have watched his videos. He's relatively popular, particularly among younger men, um, is what it seems to be. Um, and so this is a question about Jordan Peterson. It says, I'm a fan of the popular author Jordan Peterson, a clinical 
psychologist who uses Christian ideas and biblical reference in conjunction with traditional psychology to try and help people make sense of their lives. I think it was a pretty good summary. I should have just read the question first. Anyway, um, it says, He has not publicly gone on record and verbally proclaimed his belief in Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, as Paul instructs the church in Rome to do in uh, Romans 10, verses 9 through 10. And then it lists the scripture here, um, which I'll read later. It says, However, recently, when asked if he believes in God, Peterson replied, People have asked me if I believe in God, and I said that I act as though he exists, which for me is a fine definition of belief, because I think the best indication of someone's belief is their action rather than their statements about their beliefs. So the question is, how does one make sense of his lack of explicit verbal confession? And then you know, the question goes on and, and explains some different things, but I think that's helpful for us, right? Um, you know, what do we do with people who aren't explicitly Christian, but who seem to follow Jesus and, and maybe what are the implications of that uh, for for our lives um, what I will say at the start is that I also actually really appreciate Jordan Peterson I enjoy his writing um, he's got a lot of depth I think I mean he's a very smart guy very smart guy but but I think does some really interesting things with how he interprets the Bible psychologically um, which I think is pretty helpful for us and, and of course you know that shouldn't be surprising that the Bible can be interpreted in this way because these are ancient texts that, if indeed inspired by God, should be able to touch all of human life. Um, I do have some critiques of his work from a particularly Christian perspective, some theological critiques of his work, um, which I might get into in answering this question. I'm not really sure. We'll see where I end up. Um, so maybe I'll save this for later. Um, but I guess the question is this, right? Like. Um, if some is someone saved, if they do what Jesus said, but they're unclear about traditional Christian doctrines, because when you look at Peterson's work, one of the things that he does is he often talks about the certainly Old Testament um, narratives, but he also brings in the teaching of Jesus, notably Jesus teaching in the Sermon on the Mount. Um, so he brings in this teaching of Jesus and talks about how one can apply it to their life. And he does that a lot actually. And so to me, the question is, is can someone, um, quote, be saved? What is their kind of relationship to God if they're applying the teaching of Jesus to their life, but maybe they don't believe in traditional Christian doctrine. Maybe they're not sure about the resurrection. Maybe they're not sure um, about the church and some of these different things. I mean, where does that place them? What's their relationship with God? And so I guess uh, a few things to consider, right? First, I would say, you know, like we've talked about, it's incredibly easy to be saved. You simply just receive it. Everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. And and I think our challenge here is that really we tend to, I, I, in a positive way, I think sometimes we're concerned about the eternity of people, hopefully. Uh, sometimes maybe in the less, maybe, maybe more cynical perspective is that sometimes we just want to put people on a side. You know, we want to put people in a group so that we can feel perhaps superior to them. It's like, well, yeah, this guy's really smart and I don't understand half of what he says, but I'm in and he's out. You know, we sometimes want to do that as people. Um, and so I would just say, you know, if that's our motivation, we do have to check that and just be aware of that. Um, so it's incredibly easy to be saved. But the second part, I think it's helpful to then turn to this to this passage in Romans 10 uh, that was mentioned, um, this connection of the verbal proclamation of our faith. And I'll read this from Romans 10, um, verses 9, 9 and 10. Um, it says, If you declare with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For it's with your heart that you believe and are justified. And it's with your mouth that you profess your faith and are saved. Um, and so, you know, when we think about that, generally this is connected to, I mean, I had this discussion uh, in like 2012 with a homeless guy outside of Ranger Joe's in Columbus, Georgia, and he pulled this verse out, you know, it was a fascinating story, more on that another time. Uh, but it's this idea that like, I have to believe and then say it. And if I then say, then I'm good. Uh, and so a lot of times what's then pushed for is this, this idea of a verbal proclamation of my faith. Well, of course, then the question is, is how many people, you know, it's the question that the, that the um, listener put in the, uh, in the question itself. I didn't rephrase that very well. You know what I'm trying to say though. Um, how many people, you know, what is the category at which that verbal proclamation counts? And I was just reminded of a couple of biblical instances from the gospels, right? This, 
the, the, the story of Joseph of Arimathea and Nicodemus, the men who took Jesus' body off the cross. Nicodemus, who came to Jesus in what we find John 3, comes to him at night. Um, but these two men who were members of the Sanhedrin, the Jewish high council, um, who were elites in the society, but who were told were secret followers of Jesus because they were afraid of the Jews. And so they didn't have these... Um, they, they didn't have the outspoken verbal proclamation, but when Jesus was crucified, they were there for him when his other disciples left. Maybe there's something to that. Uh, we also have the story of, of the thief on the cross, the man, one of the men who's crucified beside Jesus, a legitimate criminal who has been put to death for, for his crimes. And um, he, he just has this conversation with Jesus um, and he says, Lord, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And Jesus responds to him and says, behold, today you will be with me in paradise. Now, this guy doesn't have like a conversation with anyone else. It's just him and Jesus. So, you know, maybe we ask this question, well, is that enough? What are we getting at? Well, uh, I think, you know, we have to avoid being too mechanical about this. And remember that we're not saved by our verbal profession necessarily. Uh, we are saved by grace through faith. This is a gift of God, and it's not something that we've done ourselves so that we can boast about it. I think where a lot of um, Christians get in trouble is that they do boast about it because it's something that they think at one level that they've done. And I know that's maybe challenging because maybe that's not the wording that they use, but when you look at the postures and the attitudes, it does sometimes seem to be the case, right? Um, and so just remember that. We are not saved by Christianity, and we're not saved by our verbal proclamations or even our activities. We are saved by God's grace through our faith in Him, our trust in Him. Uh, I would then maybe move to this quote from C.S. Lewis. This is what he said, and I think it's helpful for us. So the world does not consist of 100% Christians and 100% non-Christians. There are people, a great many of them, who are slowly ceasing to be Christians, but who still call themselves by that name. Some of them are clergymen. There are other people who are slowly becoming Christians, though they do not yet call themselves so. There are people who do not accept the full Christian doctrine about Christ, but who are so strongly attracted by him that they are his in a much deeper sense than they themselves understand. Quick pause. I think that's true of someone like a Jordan Peterson, and maybe a lot of, uh, honestly, a number of friends that I know. It's just interesting to me. Continuing on, there are people in other religions who are being led by God's secret influence, the Holy Spirit. John Wesley called this idea prevenient grace, the Holy Spirit working in our lives, who are led by God's secret influence to concentrate on those parts of their religion which are most in agreement with Christianity and who thus belong to Christ without even knowing it. And I think for me, that's what, that's what Romans 10 is getting at, this passage that the Apostle Paul is talking about. Uh, because in verse 8 of that passage, now I read verses 9 and 10, which is traditionally referred to. But if you look at the totality of that passage, in verse 8, he actually quotes a line from Deuteronomy 30, from the Torah, from, from the teaching, the lips of Moses. This is what he quotes uh, in verse 8, from Deuteronomy chapter 30, verse 14. Um, the Apostle Paul quotes here and says, The word is near you. It is in your mouth and in your heart. That is the message concerning faith that we proclaim. And then continuing on, he says, Now if you declare with your mouth Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For it is with your heart that you believe and are justified. And it is with your mouth that you profess and are saved. Um, and when you look at Deuteronomy 30, one of the things that I think is so interesting, see, this is why context is so important, right? Um, and why it's so important to read, read the actual scriptures and to read them in light of other scriptures is, our tendency would be to take what Paul said there and make it this mechanical thing. But what does it really mean to believe in your heart? And what does it really mean to confess with your mouth? And then when you go back to Deuteronomy 30, what you realize that Moses is talking about is he's talking about this obedience to the commands of God. This is what he says in verses 15 and 16. I think it's very helpful for making sense of this entire passage. Um, De De Deuteronomy 30, that's hard to say. Deuteronomy 30, verses 15 and 16. See, I set before you today life and prosperity, death and destruction. For I command you today to love the Lord your God, to walk in obedience to him and to keep his commands, decrees and laws. Then you will live and increase and the Lord your God will bless you in the land you are entering to possess. I think for me, as I look at this and as I talk to people, it's the point is not simply saying the words, but recognizing, like Jordan Peterson is saying, that belief and action are actually inextricable. Like you can't separate those two things. If you don't, if you don't do something, then you don't actually believe it. 
right? Like if you are, if you think that you're a Christian, but you don't actually do the teachings of Jesus, then do you actually believe Jesus? You know, and if you're not willing to, to put in his, his, commands, his recommendations, his teaching about asking God for daily bread, then are you really trusting him for eternity? I mean, it seems to me extremely unlikely and highly improbable that that's the case. Um, and so it's worth considering, right? There is this, this um, belief and action are inextricable. James says, you know, show me your faith without your works. He says, faith without works is dead. Is that uh, it will there will ultimately, there will always be a connection there because what you believe you will actually do. And which is why I think Peterson's point there is very helpful. And if you listen to what he's actually saying, he's saying, well, yes, I believe in God because I act as though it's true, uh, which is putting an emphasis on action and not merely intellectual assent, which is the challenge that our culture has faced, particularly in terms of Christianity, is putting all of the emphasis on agreeing to something up here. Um, when what the text actually says in Romans 10 is believe with your heart, right? And in the ancient world, the heart is not just feelings and emotions, but it's also the source of the will, right? The seed of the will itself. And so that your very core of who you are, you are willing belief in God that will then result in activity, I think demonstrated here by your mouth confessing that Jesus is Lord. Um, hopefully that's helpful um, on that on that point. And I think that's all we're going to say about that. Um, you know, well, I'll, I'll actually, I'll end with this. Um, it's important for us in all of this stuff about talking about Christianity or religion in general to, to keep in mind what it is the earliest followers of Jesus actually believed about him uh, and what it is that they said and what it is that they claimed. I and mean, that's what the writings in the New Testament are. This idea that Jesus is Lord, that he was crucified, died, and buried, and that on the third day he was raised from the dead, and that he appeared to people who formed the movement of Jesus' disciples that we now know as the church. Um, so if you have questions, hey, feel free to send those. We have several more weeks where we're doing this, and some great um, questions coming up on forgiveness, on um, the Bible and Genesis in particular, and its relationship to science, on dinosaurs, ghosts. Um, discipleship and how we actually pray and follow Jesus in the course of our daily life. I'm excited for what's coming up and, and hope that um, if you have a question, you'd send it in. Much appreciated for that and love to answer it in any way that I can. Um, I'm going to pray for you all today and then and then um, you can just go on with your life, I guess. That's what you should do. All right, let's pray um, as we close things out today. Father, we thank you for your grace, for your love, for your mercy, for giving us wisdom and insight and understanding into who you are and how you've made the world. And we pray that we would orient our lives towards you, that we would learn what it means to love the Lord our God with all our heart, all our minds, all our soul, and all our strength, and learn to love our neighbors as ourselves. And I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Y'all have a great week. Any questions, send those in. Uh, check out all the links in this post. Uh, we will catch you next time. Y'all have a great week. Make a great day. We'll see you later.